uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time in Durham, North Carolina. I know we're presenting to people from all over the world, so good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening for uh, everybody who's tuned in. We've got an exciting webinar uh, uh, tonight uh, that we will be presenting, and uh, let me do my screen share here so that you guys can follow me along. <coughs> Through the course of the uh, webinar, you'll have the opportunity to uh, post questions in the chat box, so please take the time to ask us questions. Uh, the faculty uh, will try to get to these questions throughout the course of the evening. You'll also notice that while we're going through the evening's webinar, uh, that there will be polls that show up. Please take the time to answer those polls as they will give us some information uh, as to how to construct future webinars, but also give us some feedback as to your sentiment on uh, different clinical scenarios. So we're presenting Nailing It in the OR, uh, presented by MedShape. The faculty is uh, myself. Uh, I'm an associate professor of orthopedic surgery at Duke University. Um, and along with me, uh, Dr. Samuel Adams, who's an assistant professor at Duke Orthopedics and director of foot and ankle research uh, at our institution, uh, will be uh, hosting the second half of, of the webinar. We have a fairly full agenda. Uh, we will try to wrap things up within an hour. But I'll talk about the design rationale of the nail, uh, the MedShape nail. The technique of insertion, because it will be a little bit different uh, given the features of the nail. Sam, Dr. Adams will be then talking about different surgical approaches that you can take to perform tibio tailor calcate infusions. He'll talk about tips that we have learned on the insertion and lessons learned uh, through the process of uh, placing a nail at different points of the technique. And then we'll wrap up with some cases and uh, get to your chat questions. So please, again, take the time to uh, send us your questions. So I'm going to talk about the basics of the nail. Um, and really, when we talk about the MedShape nail, uh, its unique features really are surrounded by the Nitinol technology. Now, you may have heard about Nitinol a lot, but really, what is it? Well, Nitinol is a metal alloy of nickel and titanium. And it really is a shape memory substance, a shape memory metal that has a lot of elasticity. And its uniqueness allows it to undergo deformation at one temperature and then recover its original undeformed shape at a different temperature. And it initially got a lot of traction and a lot of uh, attention in the medical world in the, in the stent world uh, in cardiology. Now, nitinol has enormous elasticity and in some of its shapes and forms, it can be 10 to 30 times that of, its, uh, of the ordinary metals. And so we've seen nitinol percolate its way through different orthopedic implants, uh, some of which I've shown here that have, taken, uh, that have been very successful um, in addressing different orthopedic issues from uh, fusions to lesser toe surgery, Aikens, and, and uh, fusion uh, surgeries for different uh, procedures. Well, <clears throat> the question was, could there be an evolution of, uh, of nitinol technology into the nail, nailing world, especially when we look at the tibiotalo calcaneal nails? And when you look at those first generation nails, uh, a lot of them had tibial locking screws and calcaneal locking screws, um, but they did not allow for ways to dynamize uh, the nail. And then we had the evolution of the second generation nails that had compression rod slots typically more in the distal uh, or, the, or the proximal screws, and some of the nails from different companies had some options for dynamization in the proximal screws. Um, and then you come to the third generation nails, which allowed for internal compression through different mechanisms uh, that could allow you to get uh, both subtalar or, and or ankle um, um, compression. Now the problem was, it was that an internal screw design mitigates compression loss due to the instrument removal. So once you took off the, the instrumentation that allows you to, uh, to do the insertion, if you had a device that did not have internal compression elements, you would lose that compression uh, somewhat. So um, with those older nails, the compression was stored in the rigid titanium implant body. 
in the, the MedShape nail, you'll see that the night nail technology is, is unique because the compression is stored in the flexible night nail element. So it's really analogous to an external fixator uh, and gives you true um, compression uh, that is sustained. So the Dyna nail by MedShape really gives you features of bending and torsional rigidity that you see in the first, second, and third generation nails. But to that, you will add the axial compression and stability that you get with an external fixator. And so you get a nail that has the best of both worlds. Um, it has multiple features that we will talk about that allows it to be uh, a very powerful nail. Now, when we talk about the features of the nail, it also uh, is important to stress the, the features of the targeting frame. And so this is an animation of the targeting frame. It has different, uh, different um, um, features that are important to point out. There's this cam lever uh, that you pull down to stretch and activate or, or stretch the internal night and all element. You've got a manual compression knob that allows for you to get uh, compression through the implant, external compression. that allows for the internal compressive device to become activated at different levels. And then you have a detachable posterior to anterior screw arm that attaches to the main body of the targeting frame that allows you to get that P to A screw through the calcaneus. And then you have this outer tube brace that's on the proximal aspect of the targeting frame, but is very important because it allows to, to get some stability to the proximal aspect of the targeting frame to make that uh, more reliable when you're targeting those proximal screws. The nail itself has uh, multiple features. Uh, like most nails, at the proximal extent, you can have five millimeter medial to lateral or lateral to medial cortical screws, depending on which way you decide you want to go. You do have a slot in that most distal proximal screw that allows for application of manual compression up to six millimeters. You've got the titanium body of the uh, of the uh, Dyna nail itself. Distally, you have the ability to put two calcaneal screws in, one that can go lateral to medial, and the more distal, which goes posterior to anterior. And then you have this sliding element, which is unique to the, uh, the night nail element of the Dyna nail, which uh, it does multiple things, but it allows you, uh, one of which uh, it really allows you to do is to see how much compression you are getting through the course of the resorption of the fusion site. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So from the outside, from the external part of the nail, it looks like a regular nail. But when you look at the internal parts of the nail, that's where it becomes very unique. And, and the uniqueness comes from the night nail compression dynamic element. And the night nail compressive dynamic element has a threaded tip at the most proximal aspect of the nail. And then it has your internal night and all element that gets stretched before you put any of your screws in. <clears throat> and then you have the sliding element that accommodates both your posterior to anterior calcaneal screws and also your lateral to medial calcaneal screws. So why is this important? Well, the night and all, as I was telling you, uh, uh, as a metal is has very unique features and so night and all at different temperatures behaves a little bit differently and so what you can do with night and all is you can stretch it and then you insert the, uh, and then you, you insert your screws and then as you release the night and all the night and all tries to recover back to its normal location and as it does so it gives you this dynamic compression this dynamic element so in the sliding part of the, uh, of the night and all uh, uh, component of the nail, you have these slotted calcaneal screw holes that allow for spontaneous unloading of the dynamic element. And as the element, as the night and all continues to compress over days to weeks, as resorption of the fusion sites occurs, this night and all component will allow the screws in the nails to continue to move through the slotted holes and so you will get continued compression 
throughout the resorption period of your tibio calcaneal fusion sites. And this is really due to the pseudoelastic behavior of the nitinol because uh, it allows again for stretching to occur and then recovery to occur at, at different temperatures uh, with, with uh, the body temperature but as you stretch it and then release it the nitinol continues to want to recover back to its prior stretch state <coughs> and that's what what gives you the uniqueness of this implant so as fusion sites resort both at the ankle and subtalar joint the internal element the nitinol element will continue to want to recover and as it recovers you can start seeing at the most distal aspect of the nail the sliding element that protrudes <coughs> and if you measure that sliding element that you can see and you compare it to your immediate post-op films you can get an idea of how much compression you are getting across your fusion site and that can be up to six millimeters so this sustained compression is very important because if you believe that compression is necessary for fusions then you want to have a, a implant and a device that allows you to continue to have compression throughout the entire resorption period and so if you look at the dynanail versus the pantanail versus the versanail the nitinol element in the dynanail allows you to maintain compressive load throughout the entire fusion cycle <clears throat> the dynanail is the only intramedullary nail that can sustain the compressive load during bone resorption so it's similar to what you see with an external fixator and again it's because of the nitinol component of the nail now what we also know is that as you get compression you do get torsional stability and the torsional stability of the construct in general with rigid nails drops only uh, drops precipitously after as little as 0 0.25 millimeters of resorption so you can imagine if you have a construct that does not continue to compress through a resorption period of a fusion site that your nail will lose some torsional stability so mechanically this nail because it continues to allow compression through the resorption period will continue to allow for torsional stability and torsional stability is the only significant predictor of, uh, <coughs> um, uh, of, of your fusion so um, if you get that axial compressive load and it continues to compress you will get torsional stability and that torsional stability will increase in theory your fusion rates so that internal nitinol element is axial compliant and so because it's axial compliant it acts as a load sharing device so the dyna nail through the uh, uh, nitinol element can transfer loads through the nitinol element through the nail into the bone itself whereas most nails most titanium nails that are on the market store all of their load in the nail body and only transfer a small fraction of that to the bone so you get a lot of stress shielding. You don't see that with the med shape nitinol nail. So the real clinical advantage of this nail is sustained compression. Because you get that sustained compression, you get torsional stability. And with torsional stability, you get that improved load sharing capacity. And all of this in our clinical experience shows faster healing and more reliable outcomes. Now you see a tibiotalocalcaneal nail and you can do TTC fusions with this you can do tibiocalcaneal fusions with this nail um, you can use it in the setting of failed total ankle arthroplasties with rheumatoid hind foot with patients with absent talus AVN um, it is very versatile so the dyna nail combines torsional and bending rigidity like you see in a nail it gives you sustained axial compression capacity that you see in external fixator and that to automatically adjust the resorption because you get that sustained compression and it gives you better construct stability during healing because as you get the sustained axial compression you continue to get stronger torsional slip strength and you continue to to maintain torsional stability the lower axial stiffness it enhances load sharing between the nail and the bone so it causes its dynamization without having to remove the baseline compressive load 
used to only compress at the same load <coughs> throughout the entire resorption period. So the insertion technique is a little bit different than what you would uh, normally see with TTC nails. You can prepare the joint like you normally would, and, and Dr. Adams will be talking about different uh, approaches to TTC nails. Um, but plantar words, you will make an incision. I typically make it longitudinally, uh, almost at the mid point between the medial and lateral aspects of the foot, just where the plantar heel pad goes into the arch of the foot. So I will spread down with a mosquito right down the bone. Under a C arm, I will check to, to make sure that I like the placement of my guide wire. And you want to check both the AP and lateral. And once you like the guide wire placement, you will then put the soft tissue protector in and you'll do your initial drilling both through the calcaneus, talus, and into the tibia. And once you do that, you will start your reamings. And your reamings uh, will continue until you get chatter through the isthmus. Once you get the chatter, you need to assemble the targeting frame. And the targeting frame has different components to it, and we talked about some of these features already. But in here, you see label A, which is the tubes uh, that, that has the reinforcement uh, arch at the targeting frame. You will also see uh, in B the, uh, the dial that allows you to dial in the compression you want from the nitinol component itself. So it starts off at zero, and later in the case, you will dial that up. But typically, we like to dial it up to six. And then you can see in box C, um, a, a gradation scale. And this is the scale where you apply your, you measure your, your external compression application. You'll attach the implant, or, or your, your back table help will attach the implant to the frame itself. And then you implant the, uh, the device uh, right through the uh, medullary canal as you have prepared it. And you have a modular uh, um, uh, slap area that you can use with a slap hammer to uh, really make sure that you like the insertion, uh, that you've inserted the nail as far proximal as you'd like. You'd like to check this on both an AP and lateral view to make sure that you like the level of uh, the, the this aspect of the nail and that you like the placement of the screws where you think they're going to be both in the calcaneus and in the tibia itself. And this is now where you get the stretch. So what you will first do is you take the lever arm, you flip it down towards the, the floor of the, of the room. You will then dial how much compression you want, whether that's one millimeter, two millimeters. Typically we will do six millimeters. And then you take that lever arm and flip it back up towards the uh, ceiling of the room. You'll attach that outer brace. <clears throat> and the first thing you want to do is put your posterior to anterior headless screws um, through. And so you, you've got these cannulas to pre prepare the um, you can measure, check on a C-arm, make sure you like where it is, and apply the screw. Once you do that, you will then start preparing for the lateral to medial calcaneal screw as well. And you can do that, with again, through cannulas and, and normally with, uh, as you would with the drill bit of placing your screw. And then you apply your external compression. Okay. Now, before you do that external compression, you will take two of these cannulas. You will take a drill and run it through the cannula, through the nail, through the bone, through the other hole of the uh, of the jig, and then through a cannula as well. Once you do that, now you apply your external compression, and you do that with a dial wheel. And you can see on the gradations how much external compression you're getting. Um, and Sam will talk to you about the pearls of how much external compression we typically like. But now this is where you are getting your external compression through the TTC fusion sites. And here in B, you can see that you can measure how much compression you are getting. Once you do that, you go to the most proximal screw, and you will drill under CR through the tibia, through the nail, and back through the tibial cortex. And what we typically do, will then once we drill through all the way, we will take a second drill bit that's larger and just drill the proximal cortex of that screw. 
and then under power we will put the, the screw through the tibia through the nail itself and then we'll do the same thing for the second tibial screw we then release the nail and you place an end cap and this is what's like all right so um, at this point, we're going to switch to Dr. Adams, and Dr. Adams will talk to you guys uh, about the second half of the uh, of the webinar, and then uh, he'll present a case, and we will be back uh, to answer questions uh, after that. So, Dr. Adams, uh, it's all you. So I'd just like to piggyback on what Dr. Parekh was saying about... Um, uh, the specific indications of this nail, um, some surgical approaches and tips and techniques uh, that we use to insert the nail. This is about eight months out from a, a tibio taylor calcaneal arthrodesis in a diabetic male. Um, however, he still complained of pain. The x-rays looked great. Um, when I tried to work up his pain further, here we can see that on a CT scan he has a non-union of the subtalar joint and a uh, partial union of the tibiotalar joint. And this is really what made me see seek out a better option than just internal or sorry intraoperative compression. Um, here's the what I was discussing about uh, placement of the the or tensioning the the nitinol element. Uh, this two images on the right show that the initially before tensioning the element the nail was placed so that the uh, lateral to medial screw is just right below the subtalar joint and then you can see in the image on the far right after tensioning at six millimeters how it's dropped that that um, nitinol element or the uh, distal piece where the uh, posterior to anterior and the lateral to medial screw will be placed and then here over a period of six weeks we can see how the nitinol has returned to its resting state, but more importantly, even after that six weeks, there's still some compression that can be had. So the images on the left show that I've really I pulled that element out uh, uh, six millimeters, and as you mentioned in your presentation, Dr. Correct, that you can see the uh, the tip of the that sliding element poking through the plantar aspect of the nail, and then at six weeks that has retracted to some degree. And if you can see right in here, that's um, the amount that it has retracted but there is still some, uh, probably a millimeter or two, that it, can, that it can go to manage the resorption that's occurring. So from my approaches, again, really what I um, um, look at the most is what's the quality of my talus. Um, if it's dead and I'm going to replace it with a femoral head, then I'll usually choose a lateral or a posterior approach. Uh, I prefer the lateral approach, and I'll, I'll just talk, talk, I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, um, but a posterior approach is fine for that. If I'm leaving the talus, then I prefer to do an anterior approach at the ankle joint and a, a supplemental sinus tarsus approach. Uh, exposure to the ankle joint. Um, you can osteotomize the medial malleolus if you have to to get the foot in a better position. And again, wound healing can be an issue, but um, based on what we've learned for the from the total ankle, uh, um, our, our total ankle experience with deep retraction. This doesn't play a, a big role anymore. Um, it is somewhat hard to get to the posterior joint for preparation, um, and again, there's a second incision to close. And then again, laterally, I think that gives you the best exposure uh, to both joints from the front to the back. Um, and so this is one of my, this is probably my go-to approach. Um, I can use the fibula as bone graft, and I would avoid this if there's severe valgus. And then again, the posterior approach has become more popular recently. The image on the left um, um, is a, not one of my cases, but it is a case where the surgeon went posteriorly. And I really felt that he had a difficult time preparing the ankle joint. Maybe he didn't know where he was, but it's really hard with the posterior approach if you're going to leave the talus to get full preparation of the joints to take out uh, uh, the talus and replace it with a femoral head. And again, with this um, specific nail, um, you can um, um, use it in the uh, uh, use the jig in the prone approach. Um, so I think we'll, we'll talk about some techniques. Um, and the most important a, a part of this case is the uh, guide pin insertion. Um, several different landmarks have been described. Um, um, so when you're looking at the plantar aspect of the uh, um, foot, you can draw a line from the second metatarsal straight back posteriorly. 
um, second toe that is, and then um, try to estimate the junction of the anterior middle third of the heel pad. This is somewhat difficult uh, for me, especially in an obese patient, so I usually just, I'm going to pin the ankle joint anyway. I put what I call peripheral pins to, to kind of block out the anterior and posterior. This will hold the ankle in the exact position that I want it in. And then where these pins are entering the skin, I go between those, and that usually gives me a good starting point. And, of course, this is all done under fluoroscopy. Um, some some um, pearls for, for the guide pin insertion. It's okay to keep this pin laterally. I mean, some of the purists say that it should go straight down the tibial shaft, uh, uh, straight through the center of the talus. But this is hard to do, especially in a straight nail, and I do prefer straight nails. Um, but this is uh, the image on the left is from one of Dr. McGarvey's papers, and what may not show up on your monitors is they they have a special this is a cadaver study, and they had a device in the tibial shaft, and that would place a pin centrally down through the foot. And you can see that the pin is exiting out um, the sustentacium tailae, which is obviously not where you want your uh, nail to be placed as you won't get any calcaneal purchase. But if you draw a line where you're really hugging the lateral aspect of the tibia, this can still get you in good position in the calcaneus. Um, and here you can see one of my cases where that nail is really hugging the lateral aspect of the tibia. It's still in a reasonable position in, uh, in the talus, and it's still in good position in the calcaneus. So again, um, with a straight nail, uh, um, I prefer to keep it early uh, in the in the talus. Um, it's also okay to stay posterior. A lot of people want to put it close to the um, uh, CC joint, but again, it's the calcaneus is narrower there, so it makes it even harder to, to hit the calcaneus, and there's really no reason to, especially with, with this study that came out. Um, and basically, it, uh, their text, or this was a cadaver study, and um, in all their dissections, um, the only structure at risk um, that was was that was anterior. Uh, sorry, excuse me. That was um, proc to the calcaneocuboid joint was the nerve to the abductor digiti quinti, um, um, and this was at an average of 3.1 centimeters from the joint. Um, and it has been shown that if you do um, damage this nerve, you can, it can result in continued heel pain. Um, in theory, uh, if you're going to not get this perfectly where you want it, and you're going to err. Um, in placing your pin, you should err and aim the pin slightly lateral and slightly anterior uh, in the tail. And just not commit uh, the two most egregious errors with this case, and that's leaving the patient in varus or, or putting the patient in varus or plantar flexion. And so the image on the left, um, if you can imagine, that guide pin is heading a little bit anterior into the uh, talus and into the tibia, but when you place the nail, um, it will reflect off the anterior tibial cortex and force the foot into a little bit more dorsiflexion. Same thing with the image on the right. Um, it's heading a little bit lateral. Um, um, and as the nail would be inserted, inserted with the, in this position, um, it would bounce off that lateral cortex and push the foot into a little bit more valgus, which is two positions that you would want to err in if you're going to do this case. Um, now, sometimes you can't get the pin in the exact right spot, and you know I've made Swiss cheese out of the distal tibia and talus. Um, so we've had to devise other ways to 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 um, get the pin where we wanted it. Um, and this was just in that guide pin there. Um, look on the first image in the top left. It looks like it's heading a little bit too lateral. Now it's in a similar position to what I just showed you, but it may be heading a little bit too lateral, and we just couldn't get it in the right spot. So we pulled the guide pin back um, to the talus. You insert the drill up into the level of the talus, um, and then you really hold using the force that you have um, um, on the drill and the drill handle. You can really force the foot into some valgus, um, and that'll reposition where your guide pin and drill is going to go. So then you advance the drill slowly under fluoro into the distal tibia, um, and then after that you can sequentially uh, um, advance your guide pin and then continue to drill and then ream. And you can see in the, the, image, the last image there that the guide pin's in a much better position. Something specific to this now. Um, so you have the six millimeters of, of um, potential compression that you can get with the nitinol element, and then you have 
the external manual. Uh, when I first started doing these, I would try to get, well, I, and I would recommend that you always do the six millimeters through the night and wire, but I would try to get an additional six millimeters with um, the jig. And the problem with that is as you go uh, um, towards the six millimeter mark, um, the frame does start to um, uh, deflect, and this can cause a problem with your proximal screws. So I've gone to the point where I really don't go past about three millimeters of manual compression. And if I get to the point where I have to use this um, wrench, that's probably the point to stop. And again, that's usually at about three millimeters. And I haven't had problems inserting the proximal screws uh, by doing this. So we'll talk about the proximal screws. You know, basically every nail uh, in the technique guide mentions uh, placing these from medial to lateral. Um, however, not all the patients that we're dealing with uh, for TTC fusions um, are obese. And this can be a problem in thin patients. Um, so this is a case where I had the compression. I placed the, the lateral. Um, and luckily, I, I carefully inspected the skin. And as you can see in that middle image, there was no way I was going to be able to get the uh, skin to close over that screw head. So I backed it out and drilled and placed it laterally and then placed my uh, second screw from the lateral side as well, which I think is a viable option. Um, Things to be concerned about if you are coming in from laterally, you do need to carefully dissect and not get the neurovascular bundle. But I think in a lot of cases, um, coming in from laterally is, 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 is better. Um, you're coming in perpendicular to the, the um, cortex of the tibia, uh, and therefore there'll be less skiving. As you can imagine, if you're coming in medially, uh, you're not quite perpendicular uh, to the to the tibia and you could skive off either anti most commonly anteriorly but sometimes posteriorly as well. You can see on the image on the left I skived off uh, in both directions. And this is not anything inherent to this nail. It happens with every nail. This is a competitor's nail. But this can be a real problem. Um, this is a case where I did miss anteriorly. Uh, much of it, except for the patient came back a couple months later, uh, felt a pop while she started weight bearing, and she cracked through this stress riser. She then became non compliant, and this ended up spiraling um, um, uh, completely around the tibia and shelling for a longer nail. Um, so now we'll go through a case presentation. Really, the reason I start, one of the reasons I started using the nail is because this nail is because of what I saw in this case. Um, it is a little bit of airing my dirty laundry. It's not one of my most uh, proud cases, but um, um, the Dyna nail did did salvage this case. Um, so this was a 26-year-old female who was a smoker, substance abuse, was in a rollover MBC. She had an open bimalleolar ankle fracture. Um, the part of the medial malleolus was lost at the scene, and she also had a calcaneus fracture. However, what, what complicated things is she had a large anterior and medial wound, um, which made treatment in the future difficult, and we'll discuss that. But here you can see, um, just zooming in on the olus, but there was a lot of bone loss through the open wound. Um, I tried to be a hero and, and salvage this, which was... The bad idea, which was a bad idea. Now there's a recent paper uh, discussing primary fusion, tibio Taylor fusions in this type of situation. But um, I tried to uh, uh, fix her ankle as well as I fixed her calcaneus. Um, after that, she had to go undergo multiple um, plastics procedures for her medial and anterior aspects of the open wound. However, she also ended up having lateral wound breakdown and needed to receive uh, a flap laterally as well. She went on to fail. Obviously, you can see here that her ankle is in varus. She has no medial malleolus left. Um, she also had a fibular non-union, and she was developing early subtalar arthritis. Throughout this time, she continued to smoke. Um, so I offered her an ankle versus TTC arthrodesis, um, consulted with my plastic surgery partners. They felt with all the wound problems she had anteriorly immediately, I could not do an anterior I did a lateral approach. When I did this, the subtalar joint was inspected and actually it was uh, still well preserved. So I decided to do an isolated ankle arthrodesis. Well, this also went on to a painful non union. She's still smoking throughout this time, but she is try trying to get her life in order and go back to work. So I booked her for a TTC fusion. Um, I decided to use the Dyna nail. The only additional biologics I used were was some of her iliac crest bone marrow. 
Um, I used off-the-shelf Cancellus chips, and I morselized um, a little bit of the fibula. Uh, she was non-weight bearing for six weeks, um, and then she it was six weeks weight bearing a cast. At that point, at, during those six weeks of weight bearing, she had absolutely no pain, and again, she was still smoking through all this. I decided because she was not having pain at the three month mark, I decided to get a CT scan. Oh, one other thing here you can see um, the, the nitinol element uh, trying to go back to its resting state over the first six weeks. You can see uh, it, it has all millimeter to go, but it is accounting for the resorption that's occurring inside her body over these six weeks. Here are the three months. Here's a three months CT scan, and, and again, this is pretty impressive um, in a smoker. Uh, multiple surgeries. Here you can see that she has fusion across her tibio tailor and a tailor calcaneal joints. And again, this is really what sold me on the Dyna nail. And at six months, she's pain free, still smoking, but she's uh, working again. And that is what I have for my part of the presentation. All right, so <laughs> thank you, Dr. Adams. Um, I'm going to share one case with you guys as well, and after that, we will open up to some of the questions that are coming through the chat box. And again, if you have questions, send them over through the chat box. Please make sure you take a look at the polls and answer those as they come through as well. As Dr. Adams showed, uh, you know, uh, these TTC fusion cases are not usually very straightforward cases. These patients typically have a lot of comorbidities that makes these, uh, these uh, surgeries um, um, high risk. And you can end up with uh, multiple complications regardless of what implant you use. So to have an implant that gives you a lot of added features and a lot of benefits um, is nice to use. And so this is a patient of mine who was a 64-year-old African-American female who was having recurrent Charcot attacks uh, through the course of years. <clears throat> and we had a um, with total contact casting during the time that she had her Charcot attacks and then uh, putting her into a boot um, um, and, and then uh, eventually she got to the point where uh, she really was feeling conservative care and she was more interested in a salvage type procedure and so this is the patient with her preoperative x-rays and from here you can see that uh, this does not look normal um, there does appear to be something going on in the ankle, but you're not really clear what that something is. And then you get this lateral, and you say, oh, my God, this is pretty severe. I mean, the talus uh, is, uh, is half resorbed, and the other half is sitting plantar, um, almost poking out through the plantar surface of her foot, and this is pretty extreme. <clears throat> and then you get a, uh, an AP and lateral weight bearing views of her foot, and you say, oh, well, something's wrong here on that left foot. That uh, navicular is uh, almost uh, uh, resorbed as well, and the cuboid, calcium cuboid joint doesn't look very healthy either. And so this is a patient who's got some significant disease, significant resorption, and uh, amazing challenges in her bony architecture, all the way from uh, loss of height to her, uh, her abduction deformity and even uh, a valgus deformity. So, um, there are multiple ways to skin a cat, and uh, Dr. Adams uh, uh, kind of briefly talked to you about approaches. What I had decided to do is approach this uh, laterally um, for multiple reasons. Number one, um, I, I wanted to, I, I thought it was the most uh, easy way to get to both the ankle and subtalar joints, also to be able to do the fibular osteotomy, which I'm doing right here, and to be able to harvest that distal fibula, which I'm doing right here in the video, and uh, morselize it to use as autograph would be important. Once I did that, I started uh, prying through the ankle, and you can see me doing that with the cop elevator, and as I did this, uh, I really realized how dislocated and resorbed the talus was, and so what I eventually had to do is morselize the remaining part of the talus. Once I did that, I took the s reamers and sequentially started reaming uh, the distal aspect of the tibula, tibia and the uh, superior aspect of the calcaneus, making room for a femoral head allograft that uh, we had in our bone bank. Now, the femoral head allograft for her uh, that we had was a 48 millimeter allograft, and so I decided <clears throat> that I had to ream my acetabulum to at least a 47 uh, with the reamers to, to be able to accommodate that. So here I am taking the uh, 
uh, afibular autograft, and this is a bone mill, and using that bone mill, we can morselize that fibula. And uh, as we typically do for any type of uh, ankle or subtalar or, or any fusion for that matter, I am feathering the joint on either side of the joint. This is my femoral head allograft, and I do uh, take some time to remove any of the remaining cartilage and subchondral bone. I then uh, take my morselized uh, autograft of the fibula, mix it with bone marrow aspirate, and sometimes I, I will use uh, BMP. <clears throat> and what I do is I put a bed of, of graft, autograft, in and around my femoral head uh, site. And so in this bed, I then place my femoral head. And you can see it actually sits fairly nicely after you've reamed this with the acetabular reamer. Um, and then here I am with the guide wire and the foot in the appropriate position as I make sure on x-ray that the guide wire is placed uh, where I want it, both on the AP and lateral views. Once I like that, I use the uh, opening drill bit and opening reamer to get into both the calcaneus, the femoral head that I've uh, got as an allograft, and the distal tibia. And then you have a, a larger drill bit that you again go through. And then you sequentially ream. And again, the key here is to ream to the point of chatter, and then typically I like to ream one millimeter above that point of chatter, one millimeter uh, larger than the size of the uh, of the rod itself, the diameter of the rod itself. <clears throat> and and uh, I will uh, routinely get x-rays as I'm doing this. And here we are uh, dropping the nail into the, into the uh, tibia and uh, malleting it in place, making sure I like where it is. I take that lever arm, drop to the floor of the foot, uh, the floor of the room, and now I will dial my internal compression to a six. I then bring the lever arm back up. I now want to do the PTA screw, um, and so uh, here I am uh, uh, getting it to the trocar through the calcaneus into the cuboid. And uh, in this case, I had decided for two reasons to go across into the cuboid. Number one, because I thought uh, she could use the extra purchase in the bone. And number two, if you remember what the foot x-rays looked like, the CC joint was not healthy either. And so I can get a fusion out of it as well. And so uh, I put that headless screw in. Now, given her anatomy, I could not put the second calcaneal lateral to medial screw in. And so here I am putting across the tibia the, uh, the, the drill bit. And you can see the inner, uh, the trocar is built on the medial lateral aspects of the foot. And now I am dialing my external compression, getting that three millimeters of compression that Dr. Adams talked about. We've really realized trying to do more than that can bend the jig a little bit. And uh, next, uh, you want to go to that most proximal screw. And under fluoroscopic guidance, you want to watch yourself going across the tibial cortices, both proximally through the nail and distally to make sure you are not skiving either anterior or posterior in the nail itself. Once you do that, um, then you can measure right off of it as well. And then we take a second drill, and you'll see me do that in a minute, where with that second drill, uh, I will make a larger hole in that or proximal cortex. And it just allows the screw to bite the cortices of the tibia much more easily. Under power, I will get the tibial screw started. Um, and again, I'm watching this under fluoro just to make sure that my tibial screws are going through my nail. And then I finalize my uh, fixation with the, uh, with the hand driver. After I do that, I, I go ahead and the more distal of that t those tibial screws, uh, I will uh, prepare and do the exact same thing, drilling uh, with a larger uh, drill bit, putting the screw under power and then by hand. We take the J off, put the end cap on, and we get our final extras. And so uh, this is what uh, the different steps look like. You know, the guide wire, making sure that the guide wire is in the position I like it in, putting in the nail, um, checking the position of the nail, uh, uh, both at its most distal aspect, but also making sure that you like the position of both the PA screw 
in the nail itself as well as the lateral to medial screw. Now, depending on what kind of pathology you're dealing with, you may not always be able to get that lateral to medial screw in, just like I showed you in this case. In, in that case, you really want to make sure you have good purchase in the posterior to anterior screw. And these are our final views uh, of the proximal tibial screws. This is uh, a lateral taken in, in the uh, in the PACU, and this is uh, an AP, <clears throat> an oblique. And so uh, this patient is now six weeks uh, post-op. I just started allowing her to weight bear. One of the things that I've noticed with the med-shaped nail, the Dyna nail, is the ability to allow people to walk on this uh, about six weeks after the surgery. This is much more progressive than what I've usually done in the past where I've waited 10 to 12 sometimes 14 weeks to allow people to walk because I didn't see enough bone fusing across both joints. Again, with that sustained compression, I think you get faster healing. And at six weeks, I'm much more comfortable to allow these patients to walk. In addition, I do think that they have uh, less edema than I'm seeing uh, in, in uh, more traditional nails. And so there are some real benefits uh, that I think uh, are involved in this nail that were highlighted throughout uh, this uh, this webinar. And so, uh, Kelsey, if you can unmute Dr. Adams, we will now take some of the questions here. So, Dr. Adams, what are your thoughts on arthroscopic fusion followed by the TTC nail leaving the fibula alone? Well, I, I mean, I think uh, if, if uh, arthros arthroscopy to prepare it is, is fine, and I think the big question is about living, leaving the fibula alone. But again, when I do my anterior approach and then a sinus tarsi approach, the fibula is left alone, um, and it does not seem to be a problem. Um, um, so I, I'd be fine if, if, if you can uh, competently repair the joints arthroscopically. That's perfectly valid. It doesn't matter if you leave the fibula alone. Yeah, I agree. I think arthroscopic uh, fusion technique is fine. I do think... And one of the things that we're starting to see is people leave the subtalar joint unprepared. Um, I, I don't mind arthroscopic. I don't mind open. I do mind not preparing the joint. And so I don't care how you get to the joint, but if you prepare the ankle and the subtalar joint, I think you're okay. Um, the bottom line is you got to prepare the joint. Sam, what do you think about the preparation and, and the seeing more of those films of people not preparing the subtalar joint? So I have a whole case. Nail revision, subtalar arthrodesis from people not preparing the subtalar joint. Either the nail ends up breaking um, or they're still painful. So I would recommend 100% of the time to repair the subtalar joint. Yeah, absolutely. I just think it's easier to do it the first time around. I think a lot of these patients, uh, if they're neuropathic, maybe they won't feel it. But if it's not neuropathic, um, I do think it becomes painful. I, unfortunately, I've got on the dock in a case next week of, of somebody who had an unprepared subtalar joint. And, and I'm dreading having to take it, take out a nail to then prepare the subtalar joint and put another nail back, back in. It makes the case a lot harder. I wish it was done the first time around. Sam, what's the incidence of uh, cutout of the calcaneal screw in bad bone stock? Uh, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's certainly a concern. If, if I'm really concerned about poor bone stock, then I would uh, go ahead and use a, an external fixator. But um, I have not had uh, any of these screws pull out. Um, in Charcot bone or, or what I would think would be bad bone, but if I was concerned about it, um, I would use an external fixator. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great point. I think you can always rely on the external fixator as additional fixation if you're really worried about bone quality. I also think that if you worry about calcaneal uh, bone quality, one of the other options is you can put that screw, just like I showed in the case, uh, through the cuboid. And so you can always purchase through the cuboid and get additional fixation. Um, you also can add additional screws, so you can add what's called a home run screw. It's outside of the external, uh, it's outside of the nail itself, and you'll put a screw in from the calcaneus, uh, from the posterior inferior tuberosity through the talus, through the anterior aspects of the tibia. You can use a large screw, whether it's 6.5 or 7.0, and you can put one on the medial side of the tibial, tail calcaneal fusion site, and a rod, and you can put one on the lateral side. And so you have some flexibility. But ultimately, I think, Sam, just like you said, if you're really concerned, putting an external fixator is really important. And it's a nice, uh, quick little technique to be able to supplement your uh, fixation. Um, I think, any other thoughts, Sam, on this? Uh, no, again, I mean, I 
I've had breaks that I think at um, 12 to 15 of these so far. Um, I've only had one case of what I would consider a partial union, and it was really poor patient choice on my my part. Um, um, patient did immediate weight bearing, broke down his posterior incision, ended up getting an infection, but he still ended up getting about 50% union across his tibio tailor and subtalar joints, so I had to take the nail out. But can, I've been very pleased. Uh, I would say exactly what you said is that I am able to wear, weight bear these patients at six weeks. Um, I've had no problems with that, and a lot of them have very little pain or swelling, and I'm talking about the non neuropathic ones. So. Got it. Have you used uh, a TT, this TTC nail, the Dyna nail, and failed total ankle conversions or salvage? Sam, if you want to uh, leave with that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give my thoughts. Sure. I mean, I think it's similar to the case that you presented. I mean, um, I think this is a great, great for that, um, where um, you potentially have three sites, you have whatever your interposition, two, two fusion sites on your interposed graft. Uh, if you have a little bit of your talus left, you still have the subtalar joint, and so that's potentially three areas of resorption. I think this is a great nail for that. Um, I usually use a femoral head or um, um, uh, a metal cage, but uh, again, I think this nail is great for a, a failed total ankle. Yeah, I actually think that in the Charco and the uh, failed total ankle that's being um, converted into a TTC fusion with an intercalary graft. This is a phenomenal nail. Again, that sustained compression that you get throughout uh, the, the interfaces is fantastic. And really, um, essentially what I showed is what you would do uh, potentially for one of your failed total ankles. You can take it out from a lateral approach. You can even take it out posteriorly or anteriorly, prepare the subtalar joint. If you don't have enough talus, you just uh, take the acetabular reamers, remount, and prepare for uh, the bed for the acceptance of a uh, femoral head allograft, and then you prepare just like I showed. And so, um, uh, I think we are going to see, and, and uh, probably coming out of the Duke experience, we'll probably see um, the success of this nail compared to other nails in the conversion of failed total ankles uh, into TTC fusions with an intercalary graft. Uh, we have somebody posting a question, does the home run screw interfere with the working element of the nail? And that is a great question. So if you have concern of the, uh, of the uh, bone stock and you use this nail and you're worried of the bone stock and you put the home run screw in, remember that home run screw is going to fix your compression. And so even though the nail wants to compress more, it will not be able to compress because the home run screw has locked mm -hmm. compression. And so you do need to know that if you have a patient mm -hmm. that you use this device on, you'll get your initial external compression, you'll get your initial internal compression, but you will not get continued sustained compression from this or any other device because of the home run screw. So <coughs> if you want to see sustained compression, um, don't put the home run screw in, use the external fixator like uh, Dr. Adams suggested, and you can get sustained compression then through the external fixator by, by tightening it up through the course of a few weeks. Sam, your thoughts? <clears throat> I agree. If you put a home run screw in, you won't, uh, you'll lose the, the, the ability of the nitinol element uh, uh, to uh, return to its resting state. And if you are going to use an external fixator, I just basically leave the struts in like a kind of a dynamic mode so it can contract, uh, sorry, the element can contract, but and then the, also the frame will move with it. Um, Excellent. Great. Well, thanks, uh, everybody. Have a good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. Thanks for joining uh, MedShape in uh, Nailing in the Operating Room. Uh, it's been a pleasure of uh, Dr. Adams and myself to uh, host you guys through this webinar, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Have a good night.